We can't isolate ourselves and expect to grow as Christians. We need each other. Today, Pastor Lemming shares the final habit of deeply spiritual people. If you take your Bible with me today, and if you'll turn with me to Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 2. Follow along with me, if you will, in Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 40. And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day, about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Let's pray together as we begin. Father, I thank you for our church, and I thank you for the privilege of being a part of a great fellowship like this. Lord, there's a lot of people that are starving spiritually, starving not just for the word. They're starving for interaction and community, for relationships. And they don't find it in their church. And Lord, I pray that we will always be the kind of a fellowship where people connect with one another and understand the significance that we play in each other's lives. And even if we aren't the one who at the moment needs the help or needs the encouragement or needs the prayer, Lord, that the person sitting around us or the persons we're in a life group with do need that. So, Lord, we're providing for others while at times we're being provided for. And I pray, Lord, that you'll help us to see the importance and the significance of this final of these seven disciplines, habits of deeply spiritual people. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I do a lot of reading, as you can imagine, a lot of articles that come across my desk, a lot of books that I enjoy reading. I don't often read a book from cover to cover, but read portions out of a book that are of interest to me and things that I want to know. But recently, there was an article that came across my desk related to doing ministry in a post-COVID world. That's where we are. We're in a post-COVID world. And as I was reading through this article, there were two lines that especially caught my attention. This is what they said. Social isolation has really come to the forefront of our minds during this past pandemic. And this is the one that really got me. But there are so many who struggle with isolation on a daily basis, including some in your congregation. I think you'll agree that it's true that there are a lot of lonely and a lot of isolated people. And we learned the terrible consequences of that through the pandemic and what it feels like to be cut off from others. But what I want you to know today is that one of the greatest deterrents to a strong spiritual life is the absence. It is the absence of deep fellowship and deep relationships with other believers. Now, no doubt you're connected with your family members, or at least I hope you're connected with your family members, with deep fellowship and deep relationships. But the fact of the matter is we need more than just our family. We need friends that are moving in the same direction and going the same way that we're going, loving the same Savior, holding to the same Scripture that we hold. We need them to come alongside us, and we need to come alongside them to develop these deep relationships in this deep fellowship with one another. Every once in a while, I'll hear somebody say, well, pastor, I really don't need the church. I don't really need fellowship. I don't really need life groups. You know, the word fellowship is the Greek word koinonia. I don't really need koinonia. After all, I've been a Christian a long time, and I've been a Christian a long time. I've been a Christian a long time, and I don't really need those things. But 
If that's how you think today, I want you to stop and think with me for a moment about those great redwood trees that are out in California and Oregon. You realize that those trees are massive in size. I mean, you look up and you can't believe how tall they are or how big around they are. But did you know that even a relatively mild wind can topple any one of those towering trees if they're isolated from the other trees? Uh, the redwood trees have a root system that's pretty shallow. It doesn't go down very deep. And the result is that if they were isolated from the other trees, that they would easily be toppled by some of the storms that they have to endure. But that's why they always grow in groves. You always find these trees in groves because beneath the surface, though it's very shallow, their roots interlock with one another. And the result is the interlocking of those roots strengthens all of the other trees along with that tree itself. In other words, we so desperately need in modern American society to be interlocked in our spiritual roots with other believers because in doing so, we strengthen not only ourselves, but we strengthen others along the way. And if we're not in that kind of a fellowship, and in those kinds of relationships, it's easily to fall. It's easy to fall, I should say. It's easy to be overcome. It's easy to be defeated. Because the fact of the matter is, God made the church where we need each other. We need each other. I know that man or that woman is extremely irritating at times. But we need each other because we come together and our root system interlocks with one another. And the end result is that we strengthen one another in the process, in fellowship. That's what we're talking about. Relationships. They are vital to the Christian life. Authentic Christianity is always lived out in the context of sharing life with a local community of believers. You don't want to be a Ted Shushinsky, 20 years living in isolation to become the Unabomber. Living in isolation will make you go crazy. Thinking you can do the Christian life on your own without the help of anyone else will inevitably fail. As Christians, we're not only called to believe, we're called to belong. We're not only called to believe, we're called to belong. I understand that Christianity is first a matter of the individual. How do you become a Christian? You don't become a Christian collectively. You become a Christian by individually receiving the Lord Jesus Christ, personally trusting in Jesus Christ to be your Savior. When you do that, it brings you in to a corporate body. It brings you in to a congregation of people, into a fellowship of believers. The Christian is attached individually to Christ, but he or she is also attached to other believers in a local fellowship. Christianity makes an individual believer a saint, singular, but Christianity also makes us saints, plural. We trust in Jesus, we become his child, but that brings us into the family of God. And now we have responsibilities to one another. And now we have needs that each other provides to one another. And the Lord provides through us to one another. I notice that there are at least five things that are necessary to have this kind of fellowship. The first is faith. That's the first word you write down. It's the word faith. I want you to notice that this is a community of faith. This, these are people who are centered on Jesus Christ. They're centered on the worship of Christ, and they're centered on the word of Christ, the things that Jesus teaches. In other words, this is not a country club where select numbers pay their initiation fees and their monthly dues, and they belong then to that community. This is a community of faith where Jesus Christ has paid everything for anyone that believes in him. And they can all have a part of the community and they can all have access to the benefits and the blessings that he provides. 
In other words, this kind of community I'm talking about is not the kind of community that you find at the ball field. It's not the kind of community that you find at your class reunions. It's not the kind of community that you find at the bar. Do you realize why so many people like to go to the bar? Because they find other people they can connect with. Yes, they drink, but they can find other people to connect with that are like them. But this is not the kind of community we're talking about. This is a community of faith. This is a community where we are joined together around the person of Jesus Christ and around the Word of God and around the worship of God. And we're all moving in the same direction and we're focused on the same person and we love him with all of our hearts. Martin Lloyd-Jones is a preacher from the 20th century. He died in 1981. He pastored the Westminster Chapel in, uh, in London, England, a famous church. This is what he says. You, talking about believers, have more in common with a Christian from another culture than you do from non-Christians in your own culture. You hear what he's saying? Is it any wonder that the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 says something like this. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Now listen. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? In what communion, same word, has light with darkness? In what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. And then he goes on to say, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. In other words, the most important fellowship to which you belong is the fellowship of faith and as a community of faith we have a lot that we share in common we've all been convicted of sin and received the forgiveness of our sins we've all been crucified to ourselves and our old identity has been taken away We've all been given a new nature and made new creations. We've all been made temples of the Holy Spirit. We've all been given the mind of Christ. We've all been provided our needs in and by Christ. We've all, called, we've all been called to lay down our own agendas, our own rights, and our own needs. We've all been given the same Father, the same eternal destiny, and the same mission. We've all been bound together by the love of Christ and made to be brothers and sisters for forever. We've all been joined together in this new identity and compelled to love in, in, in the same way that we were so graciously loved. Do you hear what I'm saying? The kind of fellowship I'm talking about is the kind of fellowship that is centered around Jesus and centered around his word, and that comes when we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Hear me today. If you're listening to my voice, you're watching or you're in this service and you don't know Jesus Christ, let me invite you. Let me invite you to come to Jesus. Let me invite you to open your heart and receive him as your Savior. I mean, the benefits are that it brings you into a fellowship. It may take time to build some of those relationships, but it brings you into a fellowship of faith, a fellowship of people who have similar ideas and common attitudes and common, a common purpose and a, a similar mission, and they, we have common activities. We're all focused on Jesus. We're focused on his word. We even go out of our way at times to make sure that those who are hurting are helped, even financially helped. This fellowship in Acts chapter 2 is not the fellowship of the unbelievers. This is the fellowship of believers. This is a fellowship of faith that we're talking about. And let me just tell you something. As many problems as churches have and our church has, there is nothing like the church anywhere in this world. There is nothing like the church anywhere in this world. The second word that I noticed out of this passage, not only is it a fellowship of faith, but I want you to notice the second word is presence. In order to be a part of this fellowship, you have got to be present. Your presence is required, right? 
They continued daily, house to house, in one accord, in one place. The fact of the matter is, biblical fellowship, please hear me. Please hear, 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 this, hear this preacher's heart. I'm a pastor. Please hear what I have to tell you. Biblical fellowship cannot be done long term from your basement over FaceTime or Zoom by texting or commenting on social media. Fellowship requires up close and personal interaction with others in the church, even those frustrating ones. It requires up close and personal interaction. I mean, Throughout the scripture, we find this phrase almost 50 times, one another, one another, talking about things that believers should be doing for one another. Almost 50 times we find that phrase, one another. For instance, this is my commandment that you love one another or be devoted to one another or bear one another's burdens or be hospitable to one another. How how can you be hospitable if you're not present? Serve one another, build up one another, comfort one another, encourage one another, seek after that which is good for one another. And that's just a sampling of almost 50 times the Scripture says we're supposed to be one anothering. We're supposed to be doing things with other believers and for other believers. But if our presence isn't there, how in the world can we ever have that kind of fellowship or those kinds of relationships where we can even do those kinds of things for one another? And how do we follow what the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25? Listen to it. How do you do this if you're not together? He says, and let us consider one another. There's our phrase. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Now listen, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some. In other words, how do you do these things? How are we going to stir one another up? How are we going to stir each other to love and to good works if we're not getting together, if we're not gathering, if our presence isn't there? There has to be presence. They were together in that upper room. They were together on the day of Pentecost. That They were together from house to house. They were together when they went to the temple for prayers. They were together when the apostles gathered together the believers at the temple, and they were teaching them the apostles' doctrine. They were together. You have to have presence for there to be fellowship. There's a third word, and that's the word time. Not only is this a community of faith that requires your presence, it requires your time. It should be obvious that building strong and deep relationships takes a little four-letter word, T-I-M-E. Boy, am I glad I counted that right. That would have been bad if there had been five letters. T-I-M-E. I'm not suggesting that we should meet daily as they were doing in Acts chapter 2. This was a special time, and these were special circumstances. But the fact of the matter is we have to meet regularly, and that takes time that is set apart for these gatherings. If you're going to come to church, that takes time. If you're going to gather with a life group, that takes T-I-M-E. That takes time. It takes time to become a part of a fellowship where you're deeply relating to other believers. You can't be the last one in and the first one out and expect to have fellowship and build deep relationships with the people that are a part of the church. Did you know that we all have 160 hours, 68 hours a week? That's how many hours? 24 hours a day times seven. You have 168 hours in a week. If we spend 56 hours sleeping, that's about eight hours a night, and there's probably few of you, including me, that gets eight hours. If I get five or six, I'm happy. But they say you're supposed to have eight hours a night. That's 56 hours. There's another 40 hours that are spent at work, and probably, if you're like me, there's a lot more than 40 hours that are spent at work. There's at least another six hours that are spent eating and or driving from one place to another. And I'll make some extra hours for the eating part. (laughs) 
There's another five hours that are spent doing household chores. You know what I'm talking about? Cutting the grass, doing the laundry, those kinds of things. Vacuuming the floor. Uh, if you're raising children, you probably have another 10 hours a week at practices, games, school events, parent-teacher meetings, homework help, et cetera, et cetera. And I could go on listing things that eat up our time. Is it really too much for God to ask that you give four to five hours a week with other believers at church and in life groups? Is it really too much to ask? Is it any wonder that our children and sometimes we ourselves are unprepared to meet the challenges of life when we give so little time to the fellowship of the church? And did you know this? The statistics say that the average Christian misses every other Sunday. Now, they don't miss every other Sunday like consistently. They may be there for four Sundays and then miss three, and then be there for two Sundays and miss one. But when you average it out, the average Christian will give one hour a week, and they miss every other Sunday. That means that the average Christian only gives to the fellowship of God approximately 26 hours 26 hours in a year. Is it any wonder when somebody comes and they say, Pastor, why don't we do away with Sunday night? I mean, it's just another hour to come to church, and I could use that hour with my family. I could use that hour for rest. I could use that hour to just sort of relax in the couch and prop my feet up and I inevitably want to say, well, why don't you take that hour from the ball practices? Why don't you take that hour from your recreation? Why don't you take that hour from something else? Why does it have to come from the paltry number of hours we already give to God that we rarely give to God? The paltry number of hours. Do you get what I'm saying? True fellowship was what set the early church apart from the world. It's what set the early church apart from the world. These people love each other. These people like being together. These people love doing life with one another. They love encouraging each other. They love the doctrine of Scripture. They love the prayers that are being offered. They love the worship that's being given to God. They weren't just there for some kind of social interaction. This is a community of faith that requires time that we gather together with other believers. It requires effort on our behalf. And we come together to be more than just an every other kind of Sunday Christian that gives an hour. Let me ask you a question. Do you think an hour a week, every, excuse me, an hour uh, every other week Twice a month, an hour every other week is going to get the job done in changing you into Christ-likeness or in affecting the world around us. This whole matter of fellowship requires these things. It requires us doing life together. Number four, and I'll move quickly, it requires commitment. I'm not going to spend much time here, but true biblical fellowship takes commitment from fellow believers. I want you to notice the words again. Notice verse 42, and they, what are the words? Continued steadfastly. Those two words are the translation of a single Greek word that mean to give careful attention to, to be devoted to, to be committed to. I especially like to be devoted to. They were devoted to fellowship. They were devoted to fellowship. There are things that are providential that are out of your control. But other commitments are a matter of priorities and reflect what people feel is most important in life. So let me ask you, what are your commitments saying about your spiritual life? What are they saying to your family about spiritual life in general? And then finally, I find here sacrifice. One commentator on this passage says, Fellowship 
It was important to these early believers to spend much time together. These hours would have passed in discussing the apostles' teaching, encouraging and challenging each other, and enjoying one another in the family bond that the Spirit created. This fellowship, he says, also extended to a tangible manifestation of love for one another that found expression in sharing with the poor members of this new community. Isn't that what they did? Verse 45, they sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. In other words, they were sacrificing for someone else. Isn't that what the Apostle Paul talks about when he talks about the Jerusalem church? They're hurting deeply. A lot of people have lost their jobs because of persecution. Nobody will hire them because they're Christians. And so Paul goes to the Gentile churches, the churches at Macedonia, to the Corinthian church, and he says, look, will you help these churches? And the Corinthians said, yes, we'll give to that. We'll make sure to give to that. A year later, the Corinthians haven't taken care of it. And so Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 and reminds them about their promise. He uses the Macedonian churches and say, look, they did this. Now you do this. He even uses the ultimate example of Jesus who gave himself. He says, get this done. Lay by yourself in store every week so that you've got this offering to be able to give to the Jerusalem believers. In other words, they were displaying a sincere concern and compassion and love for other believers in need. You can't do that if you're not a part of a fellowship. You don't know what other people need. Fellowship requires some sacrifice of our time, of our talents, of our treasure. It means getting involved in other people's lives and letting them get involved in your life so that the two of you can create a bond, a bond of fellowship, a bond of love where you're doing life together and you're helping each other and you're concerned for one another and you're praying for each other. That's what the church is supposed to be. Thanks for joining us today and we hope this message made a difference for you. If you would like more information about today's message or Lewis Memorial Baptist Church, feel free to contact us. We would love to hear how this ministry is helping you in your daily walk.